this abstract algebra book is fantastic. So that's what we'll be here. So I'll be taking my computer to France with me, so I could work from there. Uh, so one other thing before I forget, uh, thanks to everybody who filled out the uh, end of day feedback forms yesterday. Please fill out the one on Google Docs instead of the, uh, that's the easiest way for us to process the information. If you're like me and at least one other person and forgot to do it, you could do it this morning and I'll email out a form and add a link to a form, another form that you can fill out before the end of the day for today. Uh, let's see, so I'm supposed to talk about abstract algebra here. Okay, and my experience about using SAGE in an abstract algebra course uh, this spring. Uh, so. I'm at uh, an institution of about 12,000 students. We're mostly a teacher's college. We've got a small graduate program that's only master's, no PhD, uh, for mathematics and statistics. Uh, the undergraduates take one course in abstract algebra. Uh, there's the description for the prerequisites for this course. Uh, we have a discrete structures, which is an introduction to proof class. And, we will have linear algebra as a prerequisite. Can you stand more that way? Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, sorry. Just, it's impossible to get. Oh, yeah, yeah. I might be able to do both. Yes. How do I turn the light off? I get the light. Thanks. There you go. The best thing to do is turn them all off. Much better. OK. Is this okay, William? Does yes, work? much better. Okay, so this was a 412 course, a senior level course. Then it got bumped down to a 300 level course, which it probably never should have been. Now it's a 400 level course again. Okay, uh, linear algebra will shortly be a prerequisite like it should be. Uh, uh, and so that's where we are. Uh, the students are junior and senior math majors, especially pre-service teachers. Uh, so the topics are standard topics. We've got a semester to do everything, sets and functions, uh, integers, groups, uh, some rings, some fields, okay? Rings and fields sort of get pushed to the end of the course just because it, the startup is pretty expensive to get them into this course. And they think, see things like equivalence classes and mathematical induction in this introduction to proof class and they all come in and say, yeah, yeah, we did that stuff and I can't remember it. <laughs> uh, structure of the course. So, course met twice a week, 75 minutes each meeting. Uh, I had one in-class exam, which was the first exam, and three take-home exams, which that included the final exam. Um, students kept a homework notebook, so Unless there was a take-home exam, they had to hand in a notebook with the homework problems at the end of each week. Uh, the idea of getting them to put it in a notebook was they'd write up the problems first, okay, then they would rewrite them, okay, and put them in the notebook, and they would come out a little bit neater. And that seemed to work pretty well. So when we say notebook, you mean a physical notebook? Physical not notebook. No, not, not a sage <laughs> notebook, just a physical loose-leaf notebook. So their homework was all in one place. Uh, and the other thing is I had students present uh, homework problems, solutions in class, and I had found that this happened a lot before, that, yeah, okay, notebook wasn't due, here's a homework solution somebody presented, you can write it up in the notebook, okay, just give them credit, say, you know, I saw this presented, and, you know, even if it was a correct proof in class, sometimes at least at the beginning of the semester, it would make an amazing transformation in the homework notebook, okay? And you'd hard, sometimes it wouldn't even be readable, okay? That improved as the semester went on. There were five SAGE assignments. I had one student, I think, who did all five. Uh, so the textbook, and this is sort of how I got into the Utmost Project, 
is abstract algebra. This is a textbook that I wrote uh, oh, about 15 years ago uh, for a publisher that is no longer in existence called PWS Publishing, which was in Boston. Uh, PWS got absorbed into Brooks Cole. The office went from 55 people to three in one afternoon. Okay, and I was also the victim of a corporate merger. Um, and so they said, well, we'll sell it out, but uh, we're not going to republish it, you know, or put a second edition out. And I had to fight for about a year to get the copyright back. And this can be done, you just have to be persistent. Because they, it's more like, I just don't want to be bothered with having to go through all the paperwork to give you your copyright back. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rob finally convinced me to put this after working on me for a year or two to put this uh, under as open source, uh, and it's now available as a Sage worksheet, uh, the entire book. Um, I'll add one one piece to that. All of that copyright release info is scanned and in the repository for the source, nice. being distributed all our WikiLeaks. So it's out there. You are the same. Okay, so what did the class meetings look like? So the original plan was I was going to talk for the first 20, maybe 25 minutes of a 75 minute period, and I was only going to do important proofs or examples if they illustrated something, and then I was going to have students present uh, solutions to homework problems uh, for the remainder of the class. And the idea is they put something on the board or they write up a homework problem, it's, they get one point just for going up there out of possible three and saying anything intelligent at all. Uh, so this was encouragement. Three points if everything's perfect, same thing on the homework uh, solutions. And if they really amaze me, okay, they get four points. I gave out four points for one homework solution for the entire semester. Okay. Uh, and it was actually to one of my weaker students, too. The modified plan okay, was I was going to lecture on Tuesday. This was at the request of the students and have students present uh, homework problems on Thursday. That went okay for a while. The final plan was just to lecture the last two weeks to cover everything I wanted to cover. So it sort of degenerated. And one, I had a couple of students who just caved. One started coming, not coming after uh, spring recess. And the other student did very, very little work after spring recess and pretty much handed in a blank final. Uh, but I did help some, have some successes in the course. Okay, so what went right? As I said, the notebooks, they f and homework notebooks, not safety notebooks, for students to write their solutions more carefully. Um, having students present at the board was a good method. I could see what they could do and what they couldn't do right away. Um, the take-home exams worked very well. For the most part, I think this, I have no reason to believe that the students weren't honest just because they made mistakes. Uh, they could use Sage, they could use the textbook, they could use any notes, okay, they could not use any other outside sources, and that, that seemed to uh, be fine. Uh, and I could ask more than what's the definition of this, or you know, give me a short proof for this. Uh, I could ask some really good questions. What needs to be improved? Okay. Uh, I think you got, especially at the beginning of the course, you have to bring the sage into the classroom every single day, okay, to sell them on it. And I like the idea of, somebody said it yesterday, coming in with a sage worksheet, even if it's a very short one, okay, for each class to show them something. Uh, Regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with the students, I think I needed to schedule those uh, at the beginning of the semester uh, outside of class, even if they were during office hours. Uh, I have a couple, had a couple of students who bought into it, and I had probably a couple of students that could have been saved, you know, even though I pretty much had an open door policy. If I was there, they could come ask me about homework problems or stage questions or anything like that. Uh, I'm still fine-tuning what I need to do between using Sage, 
lecturing, which I want to cut down, student presentations in the classroom. And the other thing is Sage, the only way to do it is have a dedicated server because uh, you can't trust all of the students to put it on their machines. Some of them will just run with it, no problem, okay, and others will, uh, well, I've got to install VirtualBox and I'm not quite sure how to do that. Well, can you bring your computer into my uh, office? No, it's a desktop and it's on home. Okay, so, uh, okay, so I want to give a couple of examples, or a few examples of actually how you might use Sage in an abstract algebra class. And so I've got some worksheets up there. Now, these worksheets are what I've done up here based on some of the, the modules that the Sage worksheets that Rob wrote. Um, and they're not, the solutions that I put in here are not sophisticated and they're not supposed to be sophisticated. I sort of looked at them and I tried to write uh, answers like I thought my students might write them. So one possibility is working with cyclic groups and uh, I'm not going to run through all the commands here but you've got some commands to do added cyclic groups uh, and you know things like that uh, find the order uh, you know abelian groups as modules uh, over the integers let's see let me scroll down here to find what I want. So, okay, so what might you have students do? Uh, working with the group of units, okay? And you might give them an open-ended problem looking at the group of units. Uh, 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 in the integers modulo 40, okay? Exploring that group, writing down everything, okay? Writing down the subgroups, looking at when those groups are cyclic. So U49 is the group of units that is cyclic. Okay, and looking down here and looking at some of the subgroups. And again, all I did was beat it to death. And that's what my students are going to do at least this early in the semester. Um, so, and then looking at U35, and that is not cyclic. Okay, and I want, so I wanted them to find show that one group was in fact cyclic, the other one was not cyclic, that what did the subgroups of these uh, groups look like, okay, and then if they do enough of these, of course, then you can, you know, write everything down here, okay, but the punchline is the bottom, okay, so using this, okay, <coughs> You want them to explore, okay, what the group of units look like for various values of n, and see if they can't formulate, you know, when these groups are going to be cyclic and when they're not going to be cyclic. Okay, so if they play around enough, can they come up with a conjecture? Then can they prove it? Okay. One of the other thing is working with permutation groups. Now, in uh, the book that I wrote, for some reason I decided that, well, the way you construct functions, you go from the inside out. So I multiply uh, right to left, Sage multiplies left to right. If I had to go back and do the book all over again, okay, I might go left to right, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so one of the reasons I think that students fail, especially early on in group theory, is, okay, again, you tell them to learn the definitions. Okay, you say it louder, they try, they still don't always succeed, okay, and that's really tough for them. 
And then the other thing is you tell them to learn the low dimensional examples. Okay, so they should know that S3 is the smallest non-abelian group. If they look at the subgroups of that, they're all cyclic, you know, things like that. A4, the alternating group on four letters, that is something that, you know, doesn't have a subgroup of order six. Uh, and, you know, can they look at the subgroups of that? So if you make them construct all the subgroups of A4 in SAGE, and they work hard at it, I'm hoping, at least my hope is that they're going to remember that group, okay? Because if you just say, okay, look at A4, okay, uh, you know that this is an example of something that doesn't have uh, a subgroup of order six, so the con uh, converse of Lagrange's theorem doesn't hold, and they'll go, yeah, 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 and then you ask them a question a week later about this, and they go, and they give you a blank look. Okay, so they've got to get in and get their hands dirty, and the point is I don't think they do right now, or a lot of them don't. So uh, this all first stuff here is just, you know, uh, basic operations on permutation groups. Okay, um, you can write out a table. So there's lots of neat things that you can do. Okay, and you can look at the order of all the subgroups of S4, and by the way, if you do this stuff, you want to make want to, might want to make sure that you've got uh, version 4.7 because some things might pick up in uh, earlier versions. Some of the commands about subgroups. Uh, so this is S4. You can tell how many subgroups there are. Uh, and one thing that I didn't really know because I'd never thought about it, okay, A5 is simple, and so it doesn't have a subgroup of order 30, but I also didn't know that it doesn't have subgroups of order 15 or 20, uh, and it's just something I never thought about, and I thought it was just me, and Rob said, no, he didn't know it either last night, so uh, you can look at things like that. Now, an interesting question might be to ask them, and I haven't even really thought about it, is why don't they have subgroups of order 15 or 20? You know, can they show this other than just generating the command? Uh, so, you know, getting them to generate here all the subgroups of A4, and I just listed some generators right here, and again, my students might do it this way, okay? And then just start generating subgroups and trying to see if they can see a pattern. Okay, and pretty soon you're going to see that they're going to see that no matter what they do, they're not going to get something of order uh, uh, six. Uh, yeah, so beat it to death. Now, of course, Sage now has a command where you can just list all the subgroups, but I didn't want to, don't want to tell them that right away. Okay, because that makes it too easy. I want them to get their hands dirty first. Right, so, so I think there's some value of that in this. So in this, it sounds like you're basically using Sage as a permutation multiplier, I mean, just so that they don't have to do the permutation multiplication by hand. Yeah. Okay. But, yes. but he's building subgroups there with generators, too. Right. He's having the students provide generators and get subgroups. Right. So there's closure. Awesome. More than just multiplying things, you have to get, until you get the enclosed a minimal flow right. set out of that. Okay. Right. Okay. So later on, you know, you can do it with rings of polynomials. Uh, so uh, computing uh, the let's see here. Okay, factoring polynomials over different fields. Okay, so example is x cubed minus 3x plus 4, and have them factor it over the integers mod 5, uh, and it's going to factor, you know, over, uh, differently over the integers, over the rationals, over the reals, over the complex numbers, okay, and realize that the f it's really depends on the field. Uh, so you can have them do things like that. Uh, one of the things that may, is maybe more important down here is computing the GCD of two polynomials, which 
can get pretty ugly if you do it by hand. Uh, um, and so I've got two polynomials down here, and uh, there are coefficients in the integers, um, and you can compute the GCD, and in fact, you can compute the extended uh, Euclidean, uh, or greatest common divisor. Uh, you can compute that algorithm and show that it actually works. But the real question down here is working with ideals, okay? And if they take the two polynomials that you've given them and ge generate an ideal, okay, then so I've done the same P and Q, and then it's going to come up here and take the quotient uh, or th this ideal and it's going to be uh, the ideal generated by x squared plus 2. Well, why is that? Well, we all look at it and we go, well, it's a PID, okay, and if you think about that, this, this is obviously going to work, okay. But I don't think the students make that really firm connection in their mind, at least the first time around. So you can ask them, why does this work, okay, make sure that you prove it, and so on. Okay, so what am I going to do the next time I teach it, which is supposed to be next spring? Okay, I am going to bring a Sage worksheet in for every class, and that's probably how I'm going to open the class. Uh, the take-home exams work well, and so I probably will do all take-home exams uh, next spring. Uh, the students, uh, the notebook worked well, and I'll have them do the homework notebook and hand it in at each class, uh, at the end of each week. Uh, and what I did last time is I made a rule that for each homework assignment, I put down eight problems, okay? And the SAGE assignments would be separate. And now I think it's going to be seven problems plus say a SAGE problem will be uh, part of that homework assignment, so they have to do something each week in SAGE. Uh, and I'm still going to ask them to present homework solutions in class. Uh, I think that worked well. I can tell, you know, where they're coming from, what they're having difficulties with, and, uh, you know, that seemed to work well. Okay, so what did the students think? This came up on one of my student evaluations. Okay, and I'll let you read it. I probably couldn't ask for a better, better advertisement than this one. Okay, so I had at least one van, and you know, and I, 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 by the process of deduction, I know who the student was. Okay, and this student uh, also was taking a course in differential equations, and just on his own, he started using Sage in this differential equations course. Okay, so. I had at least one really, really good success who just completely sold on Sage. Hmm? No negative comments, but again, I, at the end of the semester I had, I started out with seven students, one dropped out after the first day because, oh, you mean you have to have these other courses to take this course? Okay. Second one dropped out after the second week because, well, I'm going to have to do homework for this class. I don't want to do homework. I have one student who just sort of quit coming after spring recess, so I'm down to four students right now. Uh, and one student who kept coming after spring recess but really didn't do anything in the course and ended up failing the course. So that left me with three students, and out of those three students, I had two A's and a C. Uh, but the one who liked Sage get one of the A's? He did. Okay. <laughs> he did. Uh, yeah, I think he's bound for graduate school. He's already got a, a, an undergraduate degree in uh, uh, economics from Texas A&M. Uh, they would come to me and they would say, well, 
you know, how do you do this problem? What should I do? This seems awfully computational. Oh, really? Why don't you do Sage? Yeah, and they would go away. Oh, yeah, that was pretty pretty easy. And I think if I get the Sage, get them in the Sage frame of mind from day one, and I think if I bring in and start with each class with a Sage worksheet for the first month, okay, I'll never have to do that question, answer that question again, or give that hint again. So, um, the course page is up there. My slides are up on the wiki. Uh, if you want to look at it, uh, and I guess that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Right, thanks. John. So, um, would you be able to do the same thing and get class eight in the twenty students? I think so. Yeah, he talks about one-on-one -on -one meetings with students. I think so. And those homework notebooks. Right. Yeah. The homework notebooks actually were fairly quick to correct, okay? Because it was once a week, you just open it up, you get it, you get it into your, you know, a rhythm. I got fairly good at uh, correcting homework fast whenever I have to do it. I can't hire a grader because read AP calculus exams for about three or four years, and you, you'll get fast. <laughs> um, the only thing with 18 or 20 students is. You're not going to get every student to go to the board every single week, okay? But maybe that's good, okay? So they won't feel as pressure. So with 40 students, I don't think I could do it. I think the upper limit would be maybe 20 to 25. And I wish we had those numbers in this course, but I don't see them happening in the near future. Anything else? All right. Let's, let's take ten minutes or so and uh, take have a time. Yeah. Big hand on the eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Since that's almost <laughs> on the eleven.